Uh, none of us have mm -hmm. any disclosures or uh, conflicts of interest. So our plan for today, um, our main objective for today is to discuss the relevance of pharmacogenomic testing uh, prior to initiating uh, fluoropyrimidine therapy. Uh, capecitabine is in a class of drugs called fluoropyrimidines. Uh, so we'll start out with some background about fluoropyrimidine. Since not many people have um, maybe much cancer background, we're going to spend a little bit more time on the background just so everyone's on the same page and well-oriented. Um, and then we'll talk about the pharmacogenomic implications. And then Maya's going to uh, talk about our patient case after that. So start out with some background here about fluoropyrimidines. Uh, so fluoropyrimidines, like I said, these are really the backbone of a lot of standard chemotherapies. Um, they're used for many different solid tumors, especially breast, GI, and head and neck cancers. Um, they're thimidylate synthetase inhibitors. So what they do is they inhibit the conversion of DUMP to DTMP. And this is a really crucial step in the uh, production of pyrimidines. So basically in the long run, they inhibit DNA synthesis. Um, which in turn inhibits the proliferation and the division of rapidly dividing cells, obviously cancer cells. So that's why they're used for so many different types of cancer. Um, and fluorouracil is the IV fluoropyrimidine that's used a lot in combination regimens. And then capecitabine is the oral form of fluorouracil that can be used as monotherapy, uh, or it can be used in combination with other chemotherapies, kind of like fluorouracil. So capecitabine is actually a prodrug of 5-fluorouracil. Um, I kind of put this all in here for completion's sake, but really the main things to take away is this is a, uh, this conversion from capecitabine to fluorouracil is a process that involves many steps, um, and it's a process that occurs in both the liver and the tumor tissue. So the first step is uh, carboxyl esterase that occurs in the liver. Um, this enzyme cytidine deaminase is present in both the liver and the tumor tissue. Um, and then thymidine phosphorylase is the final step to convert to 5 fluorouracil, and that's found in just the tumor tissue. Um, so capecitabine's dosing is a little bit complicated, so I'm going to focus on just the dosing for our patient case today, because capecitabine's dosing varies between the different types of cancer, and then within that, it varies even more based on the specific drug the patient's receiving. So I'm going to try to narrow it down for just our patient case today. Um, so you'll see our patient today is a patient with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. Uh, so HER2, um, just for reference here, HER2 is a protein that lives on the surface of uh, cancer cell membranes. Uh, and it basically, when it's activated, signals the cell to send signals to the nucleus to tell the cell to divide and um, proliferate even more, which is cause cancer, causes cancer progression. So we can give drugs that target that HER2 receptor um, and some of these drugs are listed here. So trastuzumab is an IV monoclonal antibody. Um, and then lapatinib and neratinib are uh, oral drugs that target HER2. Um, and so lapatinib is preferred for patients who have metastases to the brain. So their cancer has spread and they have tumors in their brain now as well. Um, and our patient today you'll see is on lapatinib. So this, in the long, long story short, the specific dosing for capecitabine that we'll have today is 1,000 milligrams per meter squared twice daily. It's dosed based on body surface area. Um, and the schedule for capecitabine is typically, it's a 21-day cycle. So that means the patient is on the drug for 14 days, and then they're off the drug for seven days to complete a 21-day cycle. Um, and like I said, these drugs are targeting all rapidly dividing cells, not just cancer cells. So that's why we have to give that, that seven-day break for the patient. Um, some of your rapidly dividing cells are your blood cells. Um, so you have to give the patient's um, bone marrow seven days to allow it to uh, start regenerating those um, blood cells. And then patients, since this is used in the metastatic uh, scenario, patients will be on this drug until it's not working anymore, until they have disease progression, um, or until they have an un unacceptable toxicity, or basically the patient just decides they don't want to take it anymore. Uh, some general monitoring. So at baseline, uh, you want the platelets to be at least 100,000 and neutrophils to be at least 1,500. That's because, like I said, this is going to, um, you know, cause, inhibit your bone marrow from producing blood cells. So you want the platelets and neutrophils to be at least uh, that level when you start the drug. Um, and then it also has some renal um, monitoring. So if your creatinine clearance is 30 to 50, you start with 75% the usual starting dose. And if you have your creatinine clearance is below 30, uh, you shouldn't use this drug at all. Also some, mon some general monitoring too. You'll see this with just about all chemotherapy. Uh, keep an eye on CBC, the complete blood count, uh, hepatic function and renal function. 
and then also monitor for toxicities. So some of the toxicities you see with fluoroprimidines, um, there's a lot of GI side effects, especially diarrhea, nausea and vomiting, abdominal pain, and reduced appetite. And you might also see some stomatitis or mouth sores, which is shown here to the right. Uh, and this can vary with how it presents, but this is just one example. And then there's also dermatologic reactions, especially hand foot syndrome. So this is where, this is shown in the bottom right here. Uh, patients can get kind of red, dry, uh, cracky hands, and it um, can be painful for patients too. Uh, and then also other dermatitis-like reactions. You might also see some hyperbilirubinemia. Uh, and also the big one, again, is myelosuppression. So that uh, suppression of the uh, bone marrow from producing blood cells, especially neutropenia. So just some general supportive care to maybe uh, bring up some discussion points later on for our case. So uh, for treating diarrhea, we might sometimes recommend loperamide. Uh, for nausea and vomiting, typically we give patients on Dancidron and prochlorperazine um, to use as needed. Mucositis and hand foot is usually handled um, non-pharmacologically. And then pain management, just in general with cancer patients, we'll sometimes use opioids. Um, sometimes we'll use SNRIs for neuropathic pain. And then also NSAIDs and uh, Tylenol is sometimes used too. So now we'll get into the pharmacogenomics. Um, so 5-fluorouracil, um, so capecitabine, like I, like I said, it's a prodrug of 5-fluorouracil. So once it's 5-fluorouracil, um, it's eliminated from the body, mainly through this enzyme, dihydropyrimidine dehydrogenase, or DPD. Um, it basically makes fluorouracil more hydrophilic, uh, which allows it to be excreted in the urine. And DPD is gen generated by the gene DPYD. So if you have deficient DPYD, you're not going to generate the DPD enzyme, uh, and fluorouracil is not going to be it's going to hang out in its less hydrophilic state, basically, and you're not going to be able to eliminate it from the body. It's going to hang around and cause toxicities. So that's the big picture takeaway. So here are some of the alleles uh, that you'll see with DPYD, um, and you'll see that their alleles are given activity scores. So if you're a wild type allele, um, meaning like a star one or a star nine, you have an activity score of one, meaning you should generate a fully functional DPD enzyme. You don't need to do any dosage adjustments. However, if you're, um, you know, one of these alleles, especially like um, these ones in maroon are the ones that are most studied. Um, so these middle ones here are, they give you an activity score of 0.5. So you'll have some reduced function in the DPD enzyme. And then these bottom ones are um, an activity score of zero. So you'll have even more uh, reduced function of the DPD enzyme. Um, and you'll see that these are most common in the European population. Overall, about 7% of Europeans carry a decreased function DPYD allele. Um, but you'll also notice that um, patients of African ancestry carry this 557AG allele, which is an uh, activity score of 0.5. Um, and so they carry at about three to 5% rate. And if they have this allele, if they're heterozygous for this allele, so even if they have one wild type allele and one 557AG allele, um, they have about a 50% reduction in DPD activity. And our patient today will be African-American. So that's why I wanted to call that out. Um, so these are the recommendations from the CPIC guidelines uh, for, farm, or for fluoroprimidine dosing based on the phenotype. So like I said, uh, so these activity scores come from adding up the two activity scores of each allele. So if you have two wild type alleles, it'll be one plus one. So you have an activity score of two. Um, if you have one no function allele plus a wild type allele, it'll be a zero plus one. So you have an activity score of one. If you have a wild type plus a reduced function allele, so one of those ones in the middle, um, it'll be an activity score of 1.5. And the dosing recommendations have changed in the last couple of years. It used to be that if you had an activity score of 1.5, um, CPIC recommended starting with 25% of the normal starting dose. Um, but now they've changed their guidance to say anyone who's an intermediate metabolizer, so one or 1.5, um, you would start with 50% of the normal starting dose. Um, and then you, from there, you would titrate based on toxicity. So the, another thing to keep in mind with these patients is you know, side effects are expected. Um, with fluoroprimidines, you almost want to see side effects because then you know the drug's working. Remember, these are inhibiting all of your rapidly dividing cells. So you want evidence that you're inhibiting those rapidly dividing cells. Um, 
So if the patient's tolerating those reduced starting doses, you should really be trying to titrate up until you're at a place where you can have like acceptable toxicities. You just want to avoid overt toxicities at the beginning of therapy. Um, and then patients who have an activity score of 0.5, so meaning they have one no functional allele plus a reduced functional allele, CPIC says you can start at less than 25% of the starting dose and then monitor fluorouracil plasma levels. Um, but really, you should probably just avoid using it if you can. And then if you have an activity score of zero, you have no DPD function, uh, you're not going to clear fluorouracil at all, at all. So uh, you should really avoid these drugs altogether because you can have fatal toxicities and patients have had fatal toxicities in these cases. Um, so this is one article that kind of gave us some support for doing um, prospective genotyping before fluoro fluoroprimidines are started. So uh, basically they found a group of patients were scheduled to get fluoroprimidines and tested them for specifically the DPYD star 2A allele. This is one of those no function alleles that was at the very bottom of that allele frequency table. Um, and they did the study in the Netherlands too. So um, you know, Europe, like I said, European populations are more likely to have this allele. And anyone who was a variant carrier, so they found 18 patients who were variant carriers. And in those patients, they reduced the initial starting dose by at least 50% and then titrated based on tolerance. And they compared their toxicity rate in their study with historical toxicities in patients who carried the star 2 a allele. So in previous studies, they found that patients with the star 2 a allele who received normal starting doses of fluoroprimidines, and the, this trial, I should say too, they included people who were on fluorouracil and capecitabine, so both fluoroprimidines. So in historical studies, they found that if patients who carried the star 2 a allele and received normal starting doses, 73% of them had severe toxicities, which means grade three or higher on the CTCA scale. So basically toxicity is severe enough to where it's um, requiring serious, significant therapeutic intervention compared to 28% in their study. So using that pharmacogenomic guided dosing reduced um, toxicities from 73% to 28%. And just for context, people who are the wild type, so normal function DPD, who got the uh, regular starting dose of fluorouracil um, are at 23% rate of toxicity. So this 28% is pretty close to the standard population of 23%. So this uh, trial is the one that um, caused CPIC to change its guidance for those intermediate metabolizers. So they did the same thing. They did uh, prospective genotyping of fluoropimidines, but they looked for those four maroon um, alleles that I described earlier. So they look for two reduced function alleles and two no function alleles. Um, and then they, they follow the initial CPIC dosing uh, recommendations. So patients who had one um, reduced function allele who had that activity score of 1.5, um, they just did the 25% dose reduction. And then people who had a no function allele, so they had an activity score of one, um, they did a 50% dose reduction. And like I said, these were the uh, CPIC recommendations before this trial. And so their findings were different from the previous study because they found that severe toxicity in the DPD variants was much higher than in the standard population. Their uh, toxicity rate was 39% uh, versus, like I said, 23% in the standard population. And they found that um, this was this 39% was mainly caused by patients in this activity score of 1.5 group. Um, so yeah, toxicity frequency was higher in the participants with the activity score of 1.5 than activity score of one. 41% in the 1.5 group versus 29% in the one group. Um, so from these results, CPIC changed their recommendations to say that anybody who is an intermediate metabolizer, so if you have an activity score of 1.5 or one, uh, they get a, or they, everyone gets a 50% dose reduction because the, they found the 25% initial dose reduction was not enough. Um, and they were still having severe toxicities. Um, some additional guidance. So the package insert for Cape Cytobine, they do call out the DPD enzyme and talk about the DPD activity, uh, but they don't give doses recommendations. They do say that no dose has been proven safe in patients with absent DPD activity. So the activity score is zero patients. They say no dose has been found safe. And they say there's insufficient data to recommend specific dose in patients with partial DPD activity. So they kind of say, refer to the CPIC guidelines. Um, and then the Dutch Pharmacogenomic Working Group offers the same guidelines as CPIC. They pretty much mirror each other. 
Um, some additional things to consider. So, you know, when we do this genotype testing, we have to think that, you know, some people with reduced function or no function um, DPD carriers will tolerate normal doses of fluoropyrimidine. So sometimes you might, um, you know, you might reduce their starting dose based on this information when you didn't have to, and you're not giving them a full therapeutic dose. So that's why it's really important to titrate um, if they're tolerating okay. And the guidelines recommend to titrate after two chemotherapy cycles. So remember with capecitabine, it's 21 day cycles. So you'd wanna go through two 21 day cycles and make sure the patient's tolerating it before going up. Um, and then also patients with normal function DPD sometimes experience severe toxicity for other reasons. So it's not just the function of the DPD enzyme that can cause severe toxicities. Um, and then also uh, maybe the most important point on the slide is sensitivities and specificities of the genetic test vary. So I remember that, that slide, those four maroon ones um, are the main four alleles that they test for in the genetic tests. Um, and then in the African American population, they typically don't have those four maroon ones. They had that other allele and sometimes that one's not tested for in these genetic tests. So when you order genetic tests for these patients, you wanna make sure that you order the appropriate genetic test that will test for the alleles that are more prevalent in the population for the patient that you're testing for. 